go ahead and turn it over to Michael. Well, thanks. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Wow, yeah. It feels like it. Everybody can hear me all right? Um, pardon me? You want the lights down? That's probably good. Is that good? Do you see the slides all right? Okay, is this a heckle or non heckle lecture? Uh, it's a heckle lecture. All right, no heckling because I'm bigger than you. But uh, you can ask questions at any point in the context so you don't forget them. Okay. Um, so as Wade said, my talk, I guess we have a theme going here with Martin and Amanda. We're basically doing the northeastern coast of South America today. Um, we're going to get into why it's called Marion's Vicularia in a second. I'm sure many of you know why, and Wade just alluded to that. So... I'm going to do it in three parts. I mean, the main part's going to be the fun part, travelogue, pictures, stories, ad lib. As you can see, I have no notes. I've done this talk before, and I talk about this stuff all the time anyway. But I do want to mention a little bit about Madame Marion, and hopefully it'll inspire you to pick up a book I'm going to show you that's one of my favorite books and learn more if you're so inclined. But I'm also going to tie in Avicularia and Avicularia me, the subfamily. Uh, unlike what Martin was saying, that he doesn't have a particular interest, that is where my particular interest lies. So, we're gonna, I'm going to mention I'm no taxonomist, I'm a bug peddler, you know, I'm a traveler, photographer, whatever, but I, I do do the tarantula bibliography, I'm sure many of you are knowing about, so I do keep up on taxonomy type of stuff. So, I do want to kind of cover these evics. We're going to talk about what evic is in Suriname. Surinama, correctly, but I'll say Suriname most of the time because even people there do. Um, and Martin alluded to the, you know, we don't know what it is. The, actually, the pictures that Martin showed in his presentation look more like our hobbies Metallica than anything I found in Suriname, as you're about to find out. So, you guys all know who I am. The one thing I did want to point out, though, is that one, the Racta Gathering. I just started this little gathering in Chicago. If any of you are out in the Midwest, we had a great time in March. It's at this big reptile show, NARBC, and they invited me to do it as an annual thing, or at least we're going to do it a second time. Let's not get carried away. But hopefully, hopefully it'll do three times. So uh, if anybody wants to come out, we'll have another one in March, and it's with the best reptile show you'll ever go to. So it's a, it's a real good time. And as some of you might know, I am North American coordinator, I guess with Scott Chair, but I'm very active as the North American coordinator for the BTS. Uh, now that there's digital memberships, I know it's very pricey for Americans to get you know, the additional postage to get it, but it's worth it for that journal. And even though there's digital subscriptions, I would still just rather have it. A book in my hand is as, as digitally inclined as I am and you know I use Kindle I don't buy books anymore but when I get a journal from the British Tarantula Society I want to hold it in my hand same thing with you know if I'm reading uh, Herb Nation magazine one of my favorite magazines uh, you, you really I really want something to hold in my hand so anyways I do have a special interest in these and these are some of the rare ones that I'm working with request Ian Hershey in the uh, Vicularia and then the Pisthalma I don't know why it's like that but what is that? This, by the way, this is the only picture in this presentation that wasn't taken in the field. This is the only captive spider. Well, there's one that's captive now. I have one of Martin's pictures. It was actually collected in the wild, but it's grown up and is in captivity now. But this is what people would call Avicularia metallica. And Avicularia metallica is supposedly from Suriname. So if you go there to collect a vix, you're expecting to see that. And you, as you will see, I didn't see that. So before I, I'm going to do my, my acknowledgments at the beginning because Andrew Smith's one of my dearest friends and uh, people have asked me, you know, even this weekend, you know, what's he like? So I'm just going to give out my thanks to him. When that book came out, that was the book I've held in my hands more than any book in the world. Looking at those drawings, looking at the names that Andrew had, a lot of these uh, common names that he invented for these species that were, that didn't exist. Um, he just, he made these like, beautiful names up for them with using both like descriptive terms and geographical terms and I don't know how many times I've looked at that book so to actually become close friends with him to stay in his home with his wife Lizzie and to travel over there I just got back you know I was there in May again uh, is, is a real privilege and uh, it's it's been kind of kind of great traveling with him so I just uh, want to give my shout out to him and uh, if you guys don't know there's Andy uh, if you guys don't know, he's got a wonderful website now called lovetarantulas.com, and there's a lot of stuff you can download for like two or three pounds, which is what, four or five American dollars, whatever, like books like Berg's Tarantula, which is a you know quintessential book on tarantulas. You can now get that in a digital format. 
his books like baboon spiders that sell on eBay for $250, $300. You can go buy from his website for a few dollars. So if you haven't been to lovetarantulas.com, he does like a blog on there. It's, uh, it's, it's well worth uh, bookmarking and visiting often. And as you can see, he's a, he's a real good guy. His partner for many, many years is that guy, Paul. And uh, I'm, I, I'm just privileged to travel with these guys. Andy's not traveling with us this year. Um, so Paul and I and Guy Tansley and uh, Paul's brother Mark are, are traveling this November. We usually do like three or four weeks in November. Um, and this is, uh, Paul's like, you know, he balances Andrew. They, they're a great team together. And then Guy, a, a lot of you guys know Guy from GiantSpiders.com. Bugs and Stuff is his new business. What's interesting about all three of these British guys is they all do educational stuff now. Andrew does, you know, presentations in schools, but he also does like private parties. Uh, not only, he calls them mini beasts, not only invertebrates, but you know, he's got a nice collection of reptiles and other little terrarium pets that he brings out and teaches, you know, kids and adults alike. And Paul does that as one of his, he's got like three businesses, that's one of the things he does. But guys really embrace it, and he's got a big thing going with his bugs and stuff, and he does these arachnophobia workshops where he uh, cures people of their arachnophobia, so to speak. So these are the guys I travel with, and there's, uh, there aren't lovelier blokes anywhere. And there's all of us in Suriname. So I'm not going to do a biography on Madame Marion. We don't have enough time. But she's one of the most remarkable women you'll ever read about. And that when you put it in context that she was in the 17th century, it becomes altogether more amazing um, what she accomplished. And so just briefly, there's other photos online of her, but these are the only authenticated ones, and that's coming from Andrew himself, who, who knows very well about this stuff. You can see where she was born. She actually lived for a pretty, pretty good age for that time. Um, but she, we all think of her as an entomological pioneer, but she was also obviously a gifted artist, and that's where these illustrations come in. Um, she comes from an artistic background. She was actually a... Uh, her father was a, a, an engraver and an artist, and then he died when she was three years old, and within a year her mother had remarried, and her mother remar remarried an artist, and then eventually when she married at like 17 or 18 years old, she married one of her stepfather's apprentices. So she was always around these artistic men, but as you will learn, she was a very uh, independent and strong-willed woman that, woman that uh, worked on her own artistic talents. and. Uh, so basically, to put it kind of like in a chronological, because you, you have to realize, I mean, even nowadays, I can't even think of, you know, I'm going to be 50 next week, so, and my, my late mother, you know, I can't even imagine her going on a trip by, her, uh, by herself. And here's in the 17th century, this woman, you know, upped and went from Amsterdam to Suriname, as we're going to talk about in a second. So to put it in context of what that time is, I mean, this is, when she went to Suriname in 1699, that's eight years before Linnaeus was even born. And I won't read them all. You guys probably can read that quickly. But that's 110 years before Charles Darwin. So this is a long time ago. And for her, at 50-some years old, to take her daughter on a two-year voyage across the ocean from Amsterdam to go to Suriname because she wanted to study the metamorphosis of butterflies. Um, so that's, that's interesting in itself. That's, that's one of my, there's a bunch of biographies, but this is I, I really one of my favorite books. And uh, you know, I just did a little summary for you there that she actually spent two years in the country before she had to leave because of malaria, and then she, when she returned, she died. She was actually German that uh, moved about in Germany and ended up in a going to Holland and ended up in a uh, like a religious commune, Labadist or whatever it's called, and then ended up um, going from there to Amsterdam and then be, you know lived in Holland for many years and at the end, but. What she published, and uh, that's the original on the left there, and that's the copy I have, and I'm sure some of you have on the right, is you know her Insects of Suriname, and that's where the most famous illustration comes from. That is the why we call them bird spiders, and this was the first time that anybody had documented these big spiders living up in trees. This is the first time anybody had documented them, uh, the predation on possibly on a bird. You can see, you know, I, I don't know. We always call it a hummingbird. It kind of looks like anything. You know, there's other birds that could be similar. You see the little tiny eggs, and but she always showed them kind of like a ecological thing, where she would show the, how they live with other species. I mean, I don't think that's very realistic uh, with how the species are all congregated in one little area. But she showed that she understood how things related together and lived together. 
And that's, as far as we know, it's the first illustration of a tarantula or theraphosid spider that is actually accurate. And it, and it, it leads to a collection site that we can actually identify. And, you know, he, like I said, the ecological things, you can even see how she tried to put the silk tube in, which is what the Vicularia species live in. I mean, that doesn't look like an Vicularia, but uh, I think she gathered the scene. Uh, you'll see different reproductions of the books, obviously, so you'll see things reversed, you'll see the difference in colorings, whether she did it, or later that there would be other hired people that would color them in when, in later years when they reproduced it. And I just threw this one in there, Andrew loaned me this slide, just because a lot of you like Psilotheria like me, and this was probably the first drawing of a Psilotheria, it's also one of her works. So, it was over 150 years later that this naturalist, Henry Walter Bates, Redocumented Avicularia now in Brazil instead of in Suriname, um, eating birds, Avicularia bird eating. Um, so this kind of confirmed that she had made a, a naturalistic observation that uh, went, that you know, nobody had done prior to that. So let's do a little field trip. Uh, so. I call it in the footsteps. Um, when we were in Costa Rica in 2006, which was the first time I traveled with uh, Andrew and Paul, uh, we were following the footsteps of Valerio, who was a guy who basically uh, was a, like a graduate student that was uh, traveling uh, probably by bus or other forms of transportation around Costa Rica and ended up describing in like 1980 a lot of the Costa Rican species. Um, it's the same thing. We, we were basically going there I coined a term for Andrew years ago called arachnohistorian. That was kind of the word that I thought described him best. Um, and all of our trips have a historical bent. The way Andrew wants to you know, present things and the, the works he's been doing with his books and his future projects are all based on some type of history. So we were, we were going there to see where she would, would have collected uh, this original bird spider. Old drawing of the area. We're going to have some overlap here with Martin's talk. You're going to see some of the same slides. I don't think I need to tell you where Suriname is anymore, but there's Fort Zeelandia, which is uh, we visited. That would have been the, the port and the type of vessel that she would have arrived in the country in 1699 upon. Uh, you saw this earlier, but we're right here in between. As, as Martin and Amanda pointed out, French Guiana is still part of France. But these two, Dutch Guiana and British Guiana, are now independent. And that's how Suriname, or Suriname, in the Dutch pronunciation, uh, came about. Um, tiny little countries. French Guiana is smaller, but it's still part of France, so Suriname is considered to be the smallest uh, independent country in South America. And focusing in, uh, dark brown people know that word really well. This is kind of like the grassland area that borders with Brazil. But where we're talking about is this area. The reason being is, is there's very poor infrastructure in Suriname. You would have a much better chance if you're not, uh, if you're not really uh, well-traveled going to French Guiana than you would to Suriname. It's, it's really, uh, third world is generous. I call it fourth world. Um, it's, it's, there's, and you heard the, the trip that Martin had where they, you know, the roads are very poor except the ones that go down to the mines where they're basically raping the land. So obviously those, they want trucks to be able to get down. So where we travel, there is our first base, was a little eco lodge in the suburbs of Parimaribo, which is the capital. And the farthest west we went was along this road here to an area called, uh, is it Planer? Right here. And that's in the Saramaca district, uh, an area called Calcutta, just like Calcutta, India. Um, and then we also traveled up here, which was a, uh, a plantation called Frederickstorp, where we actually ferried across the river. And that was our second base, which was our primary base. We stayed there for nine days at New Bobbin Hall River Resort, right on the Suriname River. Um, and it was an amazing place, as I'm about to show you. And then we went down to Broca Pondo and a Brownsburg Nation, uh, Nature Park. And then the farthest south we went was down here in an area called Dantabai. Um, but that's it. We, you know, three over three weeks in the country, and we—that's how much of the country we could travel. If you wanted to go over this, this looks like a road. It really isn't. Uh, <laughs> if you wanted to travel, just like uh, Amanda was mentioning, 
um, you really, these are the highways. You're going to travel the rivers, or maybe you're going to do a float plane, but that isn't the way we travel. Um, we rent a car, we're independent, we rent a car ourselves, except for, you know, some countries you have to hire a driver, but wherever it's independent, you can just rent a rental car and just drive off into the sunset, that's what we do. So it's all based on what the roads will lead us to. Uh, there's no way we're going to go through all that or anybody's going to read it, but I really wanted to point out is how ethnically and culturally diverse the country is. If you look down here, uh, let's see where it is here, the Amer Indians is something like 4% uh, of the population. Most of the people are black. There are two waves of slaves, so to speak, and some of the slaves are, are kind of pure Africans, and some of them have been mixed with, uh, that are both West African slaves, mixed with Dutch and other Europeans, and those are the Creoles. Although the official language is Dutch, a lot of the people speak uh, a lingua franca, a local language, it's a, a common tongue called Tongo. Uh, but a lot of people did speak English. So a lot of these young guys that we would meet and talk to along the way, they, they were fine. But there's, you're, it's very diverse. All the little markets, which are, you know, where we're stopping to get our, our whatever we need to eat, those were all Chinese people. So almost all the Chinese immigrants seemed to run these little stores. And then Javanese, there were a lot of Javanese, and I'm going to talk about our Javan cook making us some wonderful meals later. But a lot of the people you see are these Maroons or the, the Creoles, which are, um, were descendants of slaves. And then the East Indians, especially from northern India right along the border with Nepal, once slavery was abolished, what they did is they started using contract workers. So these contract workers, um, many of them came from northern India. So there's 37%, even more than the black Creoles, is our East Indians. So you see a lot of people that, you know, that look like Indians or Pakistanis, and you see a lot of people that look like Africans. And then you have these Chinese at the stores. You see very few people that are Amerindian, and you see almost no people that are, there's no Spanish, there's no, you know, you're in South America, but there is no Spanish culture, there is no Spanish language, there are not people derived from that. So, moving along. So, my journey, uh, at the time I was still living in Seattle, and so I, my, my mom and my stepdad came and got me and my dog. We drove all the way back across the country over a course of four days, and arrived in Chicago, and then I flew to Miami through Aruba to Suriname. It was, it was, it was fairly painless, and uh, not that expensive to get there, and obviously it's expensive, not inexpensive once you're in country. So I arrived before the guys. When we went to Costa Rica, I was a, couple, a day late, so I decided I would, uh, I would arrive early. And I had found us a driver. I had stocked up our, our refrigerator and everything, went around town, took a few snapshots in, in the capital and the markets and stuff like that, and, and waited on the guys. This is what a lot of the houses are kind of like run down, kind of colonial hop homes. Some of them were redone. All right. So we ended up this place, Oxygen, which was really nice. Um, and I just waited for the guys. And as you can see, I mean, we weren't really roughing it at first. This was a nice, like, almost like an apartment building. A nice little pool to cool off. And these are the rooms. This is the room that Andy and I shared. And Paul and Guy had one next to us. And I was just arranging my kit and waiting for them and stocking our refrigerator. <laughs> and then waiting in the bar. <laughs> and then they arrived and, you know, our, uh, <laughs> little social evening started. Paul's looking at me like, what the hell did you just say? And why am I with this big American? So once they got there, I, I cooked them a, a big American breakfast and uh, got nominated as like the group treasurer where I would keep all our money and we picked up our rental car and then ended up back in the city. I thought I had done all my city uh, work, but they wanted to go in there and get things going. So this is outside of kind of the... Uh, what's left of Fort Zeelandia and what they've turned into like a little restaurant, museum, gift shop type of thing. Um, and this is what's what, you know, the original fort. But when we went over there, some armed, I guess some soldiers chased us away. They did not like us taking photographs around here. But this was the doorway to get into this little plaza and we had a nice lunch here. It was, it was right along the river. We're basically looking out at the river. And these are really bad photographs because I because uh, I used video for this because they were too fast to catch. So these are uh, yeah. still captures from a video I shot. But as you can see, the green guana and the beautiful whipped lizards they have there. 
And then, of course, the uh, Ranella used to be Bufo Marina, the big marine toads, cane toads. Martin showed you one of these, Skinex Ruber. So the first time we just did some frogging and, and hung out there, I also have a, I have a thing for frogs. So there's a lot of frog pictures. So our first really day of looking for everything, we w first had to go to this place, this cabin where we were going to stay. And it was, it, was, it was kind of strange. That's an interesting story, too, because we were going to go down to this resort that was going to be our main base camp. And we still had a few days to get there, but we needed to go make the arrangements and, and pick up the keys, so to speak. It was open air. There were no doors or locks. So there were no keys, but they, they were so excited to have these, these tarantula experts, these people, you know, these, these foreign visitors looking for animals that they let us into the office, and it's like a really nice office, brought us into a conference room. All the top people of this company came in, and I was like, I didn't know what was going on. We had like an hour business meeting about us renting some, some cabin in the jungle, so it was, it was kind of an interesting couple of first days. They're gonna, they're gonna get a little more interesting. Uh, <laughs> this was our first day out in the heat, which I call the day of the dead, because mm -hmm. mostly what we, we didn't see any spiders, spoiler alert, is we saw a lot of dead animals. These were just where somebody had uh, dumped some pig carcasses and scavenging on them were gold tagus. And also I had to capture that with video cameras. They were stirring away. It was a full grown, you know, gold tagu, three and a half feet long, that was eating that bloated pig. Mm. And a sloth that made the fatal mistake of trying to brachiate across the lines, mm. completing the circuit and becoming a cook sloth. So that's really all we saw. But we met some interesting people, and these are these are the uh, you know the descendants from India that I'm talking about from northern India. And so this these, this guy was really nice and let us explore his grounds. We were in an area that a Dutch team that had been in Suriname a few years before us had told Andrew to research. And it, the reason we were not just heading out into the jungle, so to speak, into the wild to look for spiders, is because. We were working on the assumption that that Marion probably originally arrived in a port and really didn't just like go deep into the bush. Bush. She started looking around, around Paramaribo, around the capital, or what was not probably not the capital yet. But she, we wanted to find a vicular in this area. This Dutch team had, and there were some specific streets and rows of houses where they had they had had some great success. So we were trying to find as close to this capital city, actually find a vicularia. And these, this boy was, you know, our little guide running us around his, his uh, backyard. And we didn't find anything there. That's their home, which was pretty typical once you got out of the party Maribo. And this is pretty typical of how we would have lunch. So after a hot day, we decided, you know, let's take a break and have lunch. We would just go to one of these Chinese markets. And basically, when we're on these trips, we live on sardines and crackers and water and coconut water for, for lunch and just hope we get a decent breakfast and dinner. But this was the house somebody had said, you know, visit this pink house. So when we went there, we met this gentleman. Look at the size of that prawn or whatever it is. Um, and he said, you know, his master, the fisherman or whatever, was out, and we should wait till he comes back. And obviously, we felt evening collecting would be a little more successful anyway. So once he got back, Guy was the youngest and the smallest, so we sent him up the ladder. And he said he knew where an avicularia lived in the eaves of his house. And what Guy found was a molted skin, but no spider. So now it was like day three or day four in the country. I still had not seen a live tarantula in Cerno. But, you know, in fairness, we were basically just plodding around the city. So we decided to uh, take another, we wanted to, obviously the plantations is really how it started. When the Dutch colonization, there were all kinds of, that's what these slaves and later contract workers were working on, were all these plantations. So we found that there was a really interesting plantation called Frederiksdorp. So you had to take one of these water taxis or, or boats across. So basically from the capital, and we were staying down here like on the outskirts in the suburbs. You know, we drove across the river and then drove up here and then took one of these boat taxis up here to the plantation. And obviously that's the ocean, that's the coast of South America. So we had arrived at Plantage Frederiksdorp, which was a very uh, nice restored uh, plantation that did, I think, both coffee and cocoa. Um, and that's how we got there. Andy and Guy, me in a silly hat. And five minutes after we arrived, then we finally found the Vicularia. As soon as we landed, and every tree like this on the plantation 
had them. And what was amazing is once we started talking to the director, they really didn't even know they were there. I mean, if they found them in their own, you know, the buildings they used, they would probably kill them on site, which was pretty common that we would find out later is that they call them jumping spiders or flying spiders. People who keep a vicular, you know how they like to just leap off into space. Um, and they think they're deadly. So we were on a mission to kind of correct that belief because they were killing them if they were, because avicularia really will, will be fond of human habitation. You can find them very easily, you know, looking up in whether it's an outhouse or whether it's a, a pavilion over a picnic table or, you know, almost like you're looking for black widows or something. They just seem to like, they'll go around human habitation more than other theraposids, I think. So there's me photographing the first one we found in its home. And there she is. And Guy was the one who found her, and there he is proudly posing beside our first avicularia. And my first avicularia in, in nature. The whole four of us, all happy. So we posed her and had a cold beer, <laughs> as we are wont to do. <laughs> nice thing about traveling with Andrew is he enjoys a good glass of whiskey and a cigar as much as I do, so breaks are common. But we started walking around, and not only were was is our behavior common, these silk tubes were very common. And it, it was it was hot, it was humid, but we could not get enough of just going from tree to tree to tree and playing with the vicularia. So what you know, you start looking at the variation you're gonna see throughout the presentation and tell me what you think it is compared to avicularia metallica, which is supposed to be the one in Suriname. And then we're gonna talk about what it really is or what it might be. <laughs> like I said, I'm not a taxonomist, and I'm not going to play one today, but uh, I do want to raise some questions. Pretty typical, uh, I'm going to show you a lot of curled leaves, that, like Martin was talking about. I mean, the best way you can unravel these leaves, these palm fronds, you know, that fall down, even old dried up ones, you'll find them in there. But on the trees, they like to live in the tree bark with fairly extensive silk retreats, and even in hollows in the tree. So. I mean, that's, that's where we would find them. And once these die and, and fall off and the leaves fall off, you find them curled up. And, and we found plenty of them just on the ground. You find a discarded curled up leaf and open it up. Whether it made its retreat while it was still up on the tree or it's got down to the ground somehow afterward, I don't know. But that is pretty typical of the ones that we found at Frederick store. Now, one thing when people talk about the pet trade or the hobby Metallica is they always talk about the lack of red. And you can see the red on the legs and on the abdomen here. You see a lot of blue sheen, part of that's the flash, but um, this definitely, you know, might not look exactly like common avix, but it also doesn't look like what people um, call avicularia metallica. And one of the questions I'm going to raise is, are we line breeding? Are we, are, is our hobby form become a hobby form? If we're selectively breeding only the ones that have a really long, whitish, fuzzy hairs and no you know, the least amount of red, on, no red on the legs, almost no red except for like a real dark maroon sometimes on the abdomen. If we're just breeding those to those, we're going to just like people produce a hundred different flavors of ball python. We are just selectively breeding a hobby of Vicularia Metallica, which is I think what we really have. I think there's more variation. Um, and now we're talking about Javanese cuisine, which I found amazing too. <laughs> That's, uh, I can't even remember what it's called now, but that is a delicious soup. So we, we relaxed. So the driver that I had met when I first moved to town that the Eco Resort had recommended to me, he said that his father had this farm and he wanted to take us out there. Now, I do a lot of herping too. My interests are pretty wide ranging. Um, the rest of my team really focuses on tarantulas or invertebrates in general. But I like to do a little herping, and he mentioned anacondas. There's anacondas on my farm. There's, you know, there's Labaria, which is the local name for the fertile lands, both for Atrox. So he wanted to take us out to his father's farm. That's when we went west out here from Parimaribo out to Calcutta. And when we got there, they took us to this. And it was thick, it was wet, it was hot, and it was devoid of life as far as we could tell. It was just, you know, we, I think we had hoped that maybe there would even be Theraphosa blondi there. You know, I, I had always heard, you know, Rick West had told me many times, and you know, you've heard over the years, they like swampy conditions. Well, they don't really like swampy conditions, do they? Um, 
and that was way too swampy for anything except maybe an anaconda, and I wasn't lucky enough. So we quickly gave up on that, and, they, and then they took us back around their area, but we started finding all these poison jars everywhere. So they were, because they were doing crops there, they were killing everything, and it's not like here where the things are regulated. I mean, these were probably the most toxic chemicals known to man, and the bottles were just littered on the ground, and we started to get a real bad feeling about this place. And it started to explain why we weren't seeing much insect life and what's a spider going to do without insect life to feed upon. So we quickly relocated across the road to uh, a forest where they had, they were basically kind of doing some uh, brush clearing by fire and we kind of went through this little smoking area into this what seemed to be a, a forest that they had left alone and then we started finding a particular area. And this, you know, you can see this was found, this is a dried up, curled up frond on the ground with the with the navicular in it. So now this one looks completely different, and you know, call it a pick a pick if you want. We'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. so you'll notice a little bit of variation, but they don't look as much like our hobby metallic as what Martin chose you from French Guiana. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Although this one has those metallic hairs. You know, it's very grisly. I always used to describe them to people as fiber optic hairs, you know, just like these little like glow light type of things, these these long bristles, kind of a grisly type of appearance. So that one's kind of closer, but still not. And you know, you can open these things all day and find the picks in them. That is great habitat for them when they're not living in the holes in the tree and the loose bark. Kite spider, you saw one of those from Martin. This is a big uh, Tidia scorpion, like he was showing you. They are fairly arboreal. This one's found on the ground. It's a real big species. Uh, it used to be called Paraensis, but it's obscurus now. How big are they? Hmm. Pretty big for, for the genus. These guys are great. These are uh, plicas, harlequin lizards, or, or they call them, uh, I think they call them tree run, race runners or something like that as well. That started to be a common lizard we would see over there. So obviously now we're getting into an area where they're not killing off all the insect life, and we're starting to find some, some cool stuff. And as Mark mentioned, <laughs> if you're in South America, you are in bat heaven. It's not like going, like here, finding a cave that holds bats. It's everywhere there's bats. If you're out at night frogging, you are being dive-bombed by bats. You look in trees, there's rats that live in trees. You look in, you know, there's all kinds of different the bat diversity in these countries is amazing. Funny story about bats <laughs> is, is uh, they were mentioning, you know, like preparations and inoculations and medications and stuff like that. Before we went, everybody wanted to, you know, get all their inoculations in order to get their malaria medications. We use Malarone too. Um, and these guys all went out and got rabies shots. And in the United States, because they're in England, where they have health care, and, uh, and nothing, no comments from you Canadians either. Um, so they could go to the doctor and they could get rabies shots. But rabies is like three shots or four shots or whatever. It's a series of shots and it's over $1,000 here. So I said, okay, I'm not going to get a rabies shot. I'm not going to spend $1,000 on a rabies shot. So every time we would go in to photograph bats, I'd be like, you guys walk in front of me. And I'd like hide behind them. And if you go to my YouTube channel, there's a Saramakan uh, bats video. And you can hear me telling telling Guy, hey, Guy, you go ahead. You've had your rabies shot. It's $1,000 in the United States. So that was a big joke. Because obviously, being the only American, I take a lot of crap during the trip. So on day seven in the country, actually day eight for me, because I was there a day early, um, that is when we uh, went to Parimari Bo Zoo. And the reason we went there is somebody was telling us that uh, there, there was a vix in the forest outside of the zoo, and that's where we're standing here. But what we found in the forest outside the zoo, we did not find one avicularia. Oh, we did find was living in this these woods, and like I said, this is surrounding, I mean, when you say zoo, it's not like an American zoo, it's like, you know, you know, like a really, like a roadside petting zoo, it's more like that. You know, just tigers in squalid conditions, and you know, what's a tiger doing in South America, you know, at a zoo? But this is what we started to find there, and this is Tapitacanius plumifes, which is the common uh, Tapitacanius that you find in the Cernum. And they, you know, live a little different. Uh, they'll live in all kinds of opportunistic things, but they don't have that extensive silk retreat that you'll see with the Ficularia. 
you know, this one, there's almost no silt there. It was just in a tree hollow. And it, it might have just been nomadic at that point. It might have just stayed there last night. But we really did not see a lot of silt retreat with these guys. We would just find them in crevices and with a little bit of silt. And there's another one. There's another one of those plicas, which became one of my favorite things. This is the other picture didn't show why they're called blue lip race runners. You can see there why they're called that. And when you see me with a point and shoot, I'm shooting video, but uh, back in the, that time I was just using a little point and shoot for video. But Andrew's filming a, one of the Tapnikinias, which is what we found around there. And we're like, okay, I guess we're not going to find the Vicularia in Parimaribo proper after all. But it was a great seeing these guys. I've always, you know, like I said, the whole subfamily, and whether this is in the subfamily or Vicularia, we'll mention at the end as well. But it currently is. Big mole cricket. And turtle tail gecko, Epidaculus rapicata, and this is what the zoo looked like. So we kind of argued about whether we would actually go in the zoo. We didn't really want to pay an admission fee to go see what we actually did find. Like I said, it's like strange animals in very poor condition uh, quarters. But we decided to go in there, and as soon as we went in there, we started seeing that. So we had found our avicularia in Parimaribo, the city, by just going to all these little trees around, you can see this just on the grounds of the zoo. And that's you know, pretty typical of a tree trunk type of retreat. Instead of being in leaves that are actually kind of curled over and you know, sealed shut with soap. So was this daylight that it came out like that? Yeah, with a little tickling though. Know? Yeah. But some of them actually were sitting out the side. And another thing that was really interesting, I think I have a picture coming up, yeah, right here. There's a lot of these retreats had these ants, and you'd see them crawling all over the spider, and you know sometimes they jerk or something like that, but they they seem to have become tolerant of all this the, these ants bothering them. But yeah, they, they would come out, or you know they they would be kind of tickled out in the manner of speaking. And amoeba amoeba, the jungle is called the jungle runner. It used to be real common in the in the pet trade. Uh, these, these guys were running all over the zoo. And then the following day was an interesting day. As I said, Andrew is an arachnid historian, and he wanted to find one of Madame Marion's relatives at graves. So on this day, instead of going to the jungle, we went to a cemetery, which is kind of an interesting little trip, except for the fact that this cemetery was surrounded by fence, and these homeless, or apparently homeless people, were using it as an outhouse. And you'd see people climbing over the, hall, the walls, and sorry for the descriptive, but they would actually hide behind these things and drop their pants. So, uh, I don't know, I, did, I wasn't too happy. I'm like, first of all, I didn't want to be looking at the cemetery, and second of all, I didn't want to watch people defecate. So, <laughs> we eventually, Andrew had gotten the photographs he wanted. Sadly, he didn't find the, the tombstone he was looking for. We went down to the Neotropical Butterfly Park, which was kind of cool, but then it became quickly disappointing. If you're a guy with a nice camera, a nice macro lens, walking around here, they will harass you with all these signs, no professional photography. I don't know, I don't really understand the reasoning. But that's one of the ones I got before the guy insisted that I put my camera away. But quickly this girl, you know, that came over to talk to us, um, wanted to give us a little tour. And, and she had this can thing, you know, it was like one of those when people are doing a tour and you interrupt them and you can just tell they're sticking to a script and they, they go right back to the exact word where they let off and it's like you're listening to a recording. That's what she was doing. And finally we just got frustrated and, and as happens on these things, we became the guides. And we started explaining to her about the tarantulas, the avicularia, the tapakinia. So we're living in this in this butterfly park that they were almost oblivious to. I'm sure they saw them in their buildings and stuff like that occasionally, but they did not know how they lived. So you can see Guy, you know, he's like I said, he does nature workshops and he, he should have been on vacation, but he's instructing this girl on how these, where these avicularia and tapakinias are gonna be found. The most interesting thing is she finally took us to the behind the scenes and it was fairly interesting. Guy's brother actually uh, works with butterfly uh, parks in, in the UK. And so he's very, and he's very knowledgeable all kinds of insects. I'm kind of the reptile and tarantula guy, and, the, and Andrew's just the tarantula guy. And Guy and Paul know a lot about all kinds of different arthropods. So we were learning a lot of stuff from them on all these trips. But she was showing us, you know, if, if you don't know a lot about butterfly caterpillars, they usually feed on a specific plant. 
So more expense, extensive than their butterfly breeding areas was their nurseries where they would raise these specific food plants for specific species. So that's what she's showing us here. And you can see the morphos. But what's kind of interesting to me is as she led us in the back and we you know, kind of cried and wandered off looking for spiders, we would go in areas that I don't think she wanted us to take. And we found out that they were breeding red tail boas for the pet trade or something. I don't know what they were doing, but they were probably catching females and just letting them you know, give birth in these cages and then selling the babies into the pet trade. But they had a pretty extensive thing with the uh, rodents and everything for feeding them. So finally, we were about to make our way into the jungle after uh, almost a week, over a week for me in, in Pari Maribo and in the outskirts of Pari Maribo. And where we went is we drove from Pari Maribo down along the river down here to New Bobbin Hall River Resort, which is right above Broca Pondo, which is a huge reservoir, and then Brownsburg Nature Park is right here. And that's where we arrived. And this place would turn out to be a gold mine. Uh, just like, you know, here, you know, you laugh how you go out and get lost, where's Chad and April, where you get lost in the desert and then, uh, and then you come back here and just walk around the hotel grounds here and you find cooler stuff right here. Same thing there, you know, we'd go on these, tri these trips, we would drive down the road wherever, but we could find everything you'd ever want to find in Suriname right in the grounds where we were staying. So it was a really great place and they were really good to us. And uh, what it is basically is it's a place you can see right on the river and they had these little huts and what happens is the people from Pari Maribo come down here on the weekend, they sling their hammocks underneath these huts, and they have a little beach here, and they, what they, they have a pumping station out here, and they pump the sand and silt up off the bottom of the river, up onto the shore, and then they haul it by wheelbarrow down, and they make a beach. There are no beaches in Surround. It's just silt wash away into the ocean type of place. There is no, that's probably one of the reasons they, they're never going to get much tourism, is there's no places for families to you know, relax on the ocean, or in this case, the river. But these guys had, had, were making their own beach, and it's kind of an interesting thing. But what they had here, and what we had worked out, is although they had these the locals coming down on the weekend, we had this whole huge place for ourselves during the week. And they did have, there's a kind of a close-up of where the people that would come down could get themselves a little kayak to go on the river, and that's the pumping station. And we would watch this diver in this kind of like primitive, like. You know, those, those helmet things, you know, the old scuba kind of gear, original scuba gear, that's what they were using. And somebody would go down there and basically hold like a vacuum cleaner, hold a hose down, and it would suck up through this pipe here, it would suck up onto the shore, and then they would wheelbarrow it and make a sandy beach. So they were putting a lot of effort into making it a recreational area, but fortunately, we had this to ourselves. And this was our home for nine days. All open air, there were kind of doors on the, there's three bedrooms, and there were kind of air. Uh, doors on it, but the rest of it was all open. The porch and then the kitchen in the back. And you can see over here was where we had uh, our, our latrines and our shower stall. So this was Guy and Paul's room. There were two, two bunk beds, so four beds really. So what they did is they slept on the top and they put their, their luggage, their gear on the bottom bed. And they slung up mosquito nets, which we were actually there at the end of the dry season, right before the rainy season started. And those were fairly unnecessary. They like to use them. I did not have one. I did not need one. And that was our kitchen. A little propane tank under here, a little, gr little grill, a little wash bucket. That was it. But this put would come alive at night. We had a generator so we could have electricity charge up our batteries for a couple hours. And this whole place would just come alive with geckos and frogs yeah. and moths and butterflies. At night, it was just great being in our kitchen and photographing stuff. It's kind of like that light sheet last night. And they also had where they had, like I said, it's a recreation area. So this is kind of like a picnic area that had a little kitchen in the back. And we had made arrangements to have this Javanese cook that works with them and his daughter kind of be our cooks. And they would cook us dinner every night and look after our needs. They'd go to the store and they'd bring us back, you know, beer and, and soft drinks and ice and whatever we needed. So this was our first lunch when we first arrived at New Bobbin Hall. And that's the road in. And so we quickly started prowling and there are road embankments in Suriname, and as he said, there no matter where you go in the world, it's one of the best places to find tarantulas. Why is that? Well, it's open, it gets sunlight, there's bug life, it's it's a good place for them to build retreats, and you'll find a lot of burrows no matter where you are. In Costa Rica, we found almost everything from Megaphidema mesomalis to uh, Sferbothria hoffmani in these in road embankments, and here was no different. And these embankments were full of Epipulpus murinus. 
and there's a juvenile, and you can see the kind of trumpeted burrow, which is among the genus is really a sign of nearness. It's the one that makes this trumpeted burrow. Like I said, there's a lot of overlap. I'll go through some of that really quickly. So just to get into taxonomy for a second, for those who might not know, um, I'm talking about all these avicularia. In Suriname and French Guiana, Guiana, you know, you're, you're, there are, whoops, sorry. Go back and get rid of that for a second. There are a lot of avicularia, aphibopus, and tapetikinius. Now, is salmopius or salmopius and tapetikinius are they in the subfamily? A lot of people have tried to remove them from them because of the fact that they do not even have urticating hairs. They have significant differences that are way beyond the scope of this lecture. But the point is, is a lot of people have tried to move them into other subfamilies. And technically, if you go by the, the, the most recent works, even Heteroscota and Stromatopelma, that two of the three arbo arboreal genera from Africa are technically avicularity until it all gets sorted out. Um, they're still uh, usually listed, and they're, they're still listed that way on my bibliography as stromatopelmony, and then the third species, Hetzricotella alabatia, is in its own genus. It doesn't even have spermatheci, so it's really, really a different spider. But in Suriname, you have Uranus, and they're, they have that trumpet-shaped dirt of silk, and they have semi-arboreal young, and it's more of a lowland spider. Rufescence is a little more adaptable, lowland and upland, and a little more diverse in the retreats. Very opportunistic in the retreats. I don't know if I have a rufescent slide in here, but we did find a couple of rufescents at Brownsburg Nature Park, and like Martin showed you, you can find them in all kinds of different habitats. And um, so these are the, the genus, and then these are a little more, these are Brazilian uh, genera of particular area. So as I just said, the burrows of Uranus are distinct, and uh, they have this vertical tube, they have this trumpet shaped thing of silk, um, and the early instars can live in arboreal refugia like bromeliads. So currently, there are, what I'm basically showing here is the most recent work, and everybody says when is this going to be revised, and this kind of is, goes back to Brent's talk, uh, uh, the keynote lecture, he was talking about the revision of Afinopelma. Um, Everybody's, the genus that's even more screwed up is avicularia, and everybody's like, well, when is that going to be revised? And you hear rumblings about what's happening with it. Well, this woman, um, although her last name is Japanese, she's actually Brazilian, her PhD thesis came out, and it basically broke it into a, a, a much smaller group. And it split the genus avicularia into all these different genera. And they didn't name it yet. This hasn't been published as a, a, a complete revision yet. It was just her doctoral thesis. So it hasn't gotten that far. So this is what we're waiting on is the final publication of all this. But anybody who's read that paper realizes that she's going to split it up into different genera and group these different species. Avicularia versicolor is going to be a monotypic species in a brand new genus. So this is kind of interesting stuff to kind of think about. These are three newly described Brazilian species that are very same, so they're going to be in their own genus. <laughs> Vicular elita from Puerto Rico is going to be in its own genus. So, you know, I'm not going to get into this too much, but there's one person splitters, and some people are going to split them into a bunch of different groups. Some people are going to lump them all, all together. But what her paper basically said is that of the 47 currently recognized species, she's narrowing it down to only 14. So the point as it relates to this lecture is if we're going to argue about it, whether what I'm showing you is avicularia avicularia or avicularia metallica, according to this paper, there is no avicularia metallica. It is avicularia avicularia. And my argument is going to be that it is avicularia avicularia because there is no type specimen of avicularia avicularia. And what Linnaeus described the species from is Madame Marion's drawing. So if we're looking at Madame Marion's spider that she drew in the place that we're looking, and that was what Linnaeus called avicularia avicularia, that's the end of the argument right there. What we found in Suriname and what you're probably finding in the Guianas in general is avicularia avicularia. Some people are going to say it's a lot of variation of the same species. Some people are going to try to split it into different species. But this particular worker is lumping them together as all avicularia avicularia, which is the type of species. So that was too much like science for me. This is more what we do is we go looking for them and take pictures of them. And we sit out here and drink and we watch Game of Thrones on my laptop. <laughs> so this is kind of what we, did, we, what we did at night after a hard day looking for them. I didn't want you guys to think that this is going to get really dry all of a sudden. That was just a little digression. Did you bring any samples home? No. 
What's the laws? Two mean? differences between what Martin showed you and what I'm showing you is that all these pictures were taken in nature. There are no captive specimens in this lecture, and we do not collect anywhere ever, period. Okay. doesn't matter what the laws are. We don't collect. Simple. Yep. And this is a, and this is a pretty typical banter. He's got his pipe. He's got his notebook. He's making his drawings. He's got his little charts. These are his little placards when he's doing photography, where we were, what species it was. He's got his pipe. He's got his beer. He's got his shot of whatever the local spirit is to ward away the bugs. We don't need Malarone. We just drink the local rum. Um, but a lot of that's what we did at night is we would go back and we would hang out. We would do night walks, but we also do a lot of photography. Now, I mentioned briefly that we we're really trying to make an effort to educate the people that we did come into contact with. There was a groundskeeper that was great at this new Battle Hall River Resort. And we wanted to let these people know, don't kill these avicularia that are in your buildings. They're not dangerous. They're, they're, they're fine. And they would see us holding all this stuff. And it didn't matter if it was a lizard or if it was a caterpillar or if it was what it was. They, they they're obviously have a fear of all these things that they don't know. So we were spending a lot of effort telling them that basically everything was harmless. And then we finished dinner, and that was on the wall. And then we had to revise everything and tell them, no, don't touch that. <laughs> Seven-legged, but it's still a good photograph. But yeah, that's the nutrient. And that's what we were photographing in the previous picture. So do we collect? No. Do we remove everything? No. Do we detain things briefly for better photographic situations? Yes. <laughs> we release it right where it was found, which was about, you know, quarter of a mile from here. But we're back at our cabin taking some pictures and then we'll release it back where we found in the morning when we have breakfast. I mentioned bats, bats, and more bats. This is actually in Andrew's shirt hanging on the drying line. And these, we call them ginger bats. We identified them after the fact. We just call them, you know, Brits refer to redheads as gingers. So they, my Brit friends called these ginger bats because they had a reddish hair. But you'd find these are really common in tree holes. They're also common in my room. And the first night when I went to sleep, I get into the room and it's, it's you know, obviously it's kind of miserable here for, for, for many of us who don't live in this type of climate. But there, you know, picture it with 100% humidity and you're in this room trying to sleep. And the first night I went in there, there's this big marine toad hopping across my floor. So I get up and I try to shoo him out and then I shut the door so he doesn't come back in. But then obviously the, the heat and humidity gets even more stifling. So I open the door back up and I finally lay down on the sticky on a sticky bed, and this bat comes in. <laughs> and he's flying all around my stuff. So, yeah, bats is something that you're going to find everywhere in these places. So, the first day that we were actually at the resort, we were kind of worried that this recreational area was going to be inundated with locals because it was their independence. Tip. You know, we talked about it used to be Dutch Guiana. It's only 1975 that it became independent from Netherlands or Holland or the Dutch. And that was their Independence Day. So, you know, just like Fourth of July or Memorial Day for us, you know, we expected this influx of people to our, what was now after the weekend had gone away, and it's Sunday too, we expected all these people, but there really weren't. But what there were for the people that did come were these young guys that, that their job basically was as a lifeguard for, you saw the little swimming area, and you saw the, uh, the little kayaks. So they basically let people rent these kayaks and go out and swim on the Seoul Beach. So they're kind of lifeguards of sort, but what they want to be is nature guides. So they were trying to learn from us, they were trying to teach us, they wanted to take us on a walk, they wanted to show us where they knew where spiders were. So uh, the first day after that, we ended up having these two young guides, they said they're going to take us to this big spider, and they couldn't describe it well, and they actually spoke very good English, but they were just, they didn't really know what they were taking us to, and, and of course they took us right to a big Aphibolmus Miranus, it was right in the trail. And uh, we're like, no, that's not what we're looking for. We've seen plenty of those. Uh, we were hoping that you found this giant spider, the world's largest spider. And they, but they were really proud to show us this. But that, again, the guides became the students, and we started guiding them on the, the habits of the tarantulas and showing them where, where they, you know, they had been walking by all these retreats for, for years because they, they weren't looking up in the trees. They were just looking on the ground. They didn't, you know, they had luckily stumbled across this Miranus burrow, and I think it was just a place where they would, they would. Uh, take everybody who they could manage to convince they were nature guides instead of lifeguards. But they were real nice guys, so we took we took back into there and took some pictures of this beautiful female. They were very common. 
avicularia. That's the first avicularia slide I guess I've shown from what they look like here now at camp. And you can see how reddish the abdomen is and how red, there's red on the legs and it's not so hairy yet. Once again, is it avicularia, avicularia? I would call it that. And at night, with the Ephibophus murinus, I mean, we were looking for rufescens. We ended up not, the, it was one of the only species we didn't find at our resort. We did find it later at Brownsburg. There were all these trumpeted burrows, which are indicative of murinus. And the younger one up on the tree, like I said, they're semi arboreal or even arboreal when young, depending on what life stage you're at. This one, it's already lost its greenish abdomen, so it's a little older, but it's still living up in the trees for now. And th this was our pet. This was this one lived in this tree hole that we would. It's a tapping against plumage piece, but we would never be able to get it out. So we would just, and it was just down from our cabin. So we would just walk there every night and chuck a little food in. And actually, there was, there was a hole, another hole lower in the tree that was full of those ginger bats. So we would visit this quite regularly. It's a real cool tree frog that. We find on the grounds. This is actually the same frog. And that's what it looked like before I bothered it, and after I bothered it, it came back to like more of its daytime coloration. Real pretty anole. Uh, they call those the golden scale anoles. That was the common anole around the camp. That's a what's the common name? A uh, tawny forest racer. Real pretty little snake that was uh, along the trail at night. And here's some of the more the rainy more spiders for those of you that are also interested in that. Cupianias, I don't know what these are, some type of sporacid. Some of the insects. Everybody knows what that is? You know what it is. Somebody else shout out what they think it is. When I was pointing at Fred, I was also pointing at you. <laughs> yes, it is a horse head grasshopper. Well, I was expecting to shout out walking stick. It's actually a grasshopper. I almost did, but then I saw the head. <laughs> there, there's a scientific name. Deplorid, deplora, probably, species. That's a really cool scorpion that I, that I liked. Not a big scorpion guy, but... So on this day, these young guy guys had told us about this place called Down to Buy, and oh, that's the place to go for spiders. And there's a guy there that it seemed like he was their mentor to be a nature guy or something. Like, oh, this is the nature guy you want. He's the jungle guy. You got to go see him. And we went down there, and he wasn't there. And the guys at his camp wanted to charge us money just to take pictures on the grounds. They didn't. They wanted some money, so we quickly left there and. This is the only picture I was able to catch before the guy said, oh, no, 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 $20, I forgot what the currency is, but he wanted money. So we did find one as we were walking out. We found this one juvenile. And then we, for some reason, this forest had kind of intrigued us where they had burnt down. There was a clearing. Like I said, clearings are always good, whether it's roadside embankments or certain clearings where there's a transition between the, the forest are, are good to see any kind of wildlife. So now these do look a little more pet trade or Metallica-ish, but uh us take area, take area. It's got the long grizzled bears. It doesn't have any you know, much red light except at the end, but you're just seeing variation in the species. It's a slender leg tree frog. You know what that's gonna be. Bat. That guy. Great spiders, one of my favorite spiders. It always has been. It was really a treat to see them in nature. Go with the tortoise. So on the following day, these guides, <coughs> we had hired them to take us on a boat ride to a true maroon village. And now these are the ones that aren't creoles. They're not mixed with Europeans at all. These are the true early West African slave descendants. And they're the ones that still have kind of like the primitive villages. So they were going to take us to this maroon village, and it was more of a more than a spider hunting trip. It was more of a historical trip, which means it was more Andrew's idea. But we have fun on all this type of stuff. So we, we decided to, uh, to go down to this trip, 
And we pull up, and it was very primitive. But there were electrical lines, so it wasn't that primitive. But the people, the women, were topless, in the water, washing their pots and their clothes at the same time. So it was very, you know, what you would expect in, in more uh, primitive kind of a culture. But then, as we tried to find out where their leader was, this woman, <laughs> out of her clothing, pulled out a cell phone. <laughs> so I realized right away that it was not as primitive as we thought, and we started getting kind of skeptical about whether this was going to be a worthwhile field trip. But it was a nice boat ride uh, upriver, basically. I mean, we were going north, but that's upriver. I mean, south, but that's upriver because it empties down into the, into the ocean. And then afterwards, we visited a really nice eco-resort that if, if you were going to go and you wanted to stay in the same area, but you, what we were staying in looks like roughing it too much, there is a really nice uh, eco-resort called Bergendahl that was a little farther down the, the road. But this is how we ate, you know, pretty easy going guys. I mean, we live on the cheap. I mean, the flight to get there, and once you're there, the way we stay, it's, it's very inexpensive. I forgot what we paid to rent this house, but it's probably what it would cost, to, it's probably what it cost for a night at a hotel here or something. Wasn't much, and this is Errol. He was the groundskeeper that that became. He took care of us so well. He became our friend, and this is a, this is a morning we kind of got in trouble because we were waiting for Andrew. We ran over and got this spider out, and Andrew was disappointed that we didn't wait for him. But uh, it was an ultimate male with the plume of peace. And there's the female that was nearby. And that is the boat that took us up to the Maroon Village. <laughs> Not as nice as those water taxis. I mean, this, is, this is how they travel. These are their roads, are these rivers, of course. What was interesting to me when we went upriver was as we started seeing all these other little places where people stay, you know, either villages or hotels, you know, places where you, accommodations where you can stay, and they all had this. But what is that? <laughs> it's piranha nets. And I had been swimming twice, twice a day in the river. They had the beach, after all. They had lifeguards, after all. And they're like, well, if you don't have open wounds, you're fine. But we like to you know, keep the piranhas out. This is the first Labari I found, Fertilands, both rock safe rocks. Um, this was right on the beach at our resort. And as we were walking along the beach, looking in the trees, guy was up ahead of me a little ways, and he, you know, he was looking in because we were looking at tree hollows. We're looking for our, a lot of arboreal spiders because we had already found plenty of Uranus. We had decided that we weren't going to have much luck with Blondie at our camp. Um, so, you know, we we do spend a lot of times looking at the trees. I've always specialized in the arboreal tarantulas. It's always been my interest, and I think for most of us, you know, guy, uh, Paul, and Andrew have done extensive work in Indian Sri Lanka with. So there, you know, we we have we do look in the trees a lot. So guys up there, he's doing this. He's just looking up and he's going in, and he almost stepped right on this thing. And I was right behind him, and I said, "Guy, look what you just almost stepped on." And uh, it was our first first labari of the trip. And they are irascible little dudes, and they do account for most of the venomation and the problems for these people there. But uh, and they are very abundant. This was one of our favorite finds. Now, this is a species that Martin showed you that we did not expect. And it's kind of interesting because in his lecture, he showed how the type location is actually right on the border of Suriname. And so I'm kind of, this is kind of, I'm giving away the ending here. Paul's pointing up way above his head. And I was so upset that he found this spider and not me um, because I'm much taller than these other three guys. And uh, I don't know how he saw this thing. This thing was, I mean, Paul's, I don't know, he's probably like 5'8", five, 5'9". And I swear it was seven or eight feet up the tree. I don't know how he saw this thing, but he, I mean, he's been doing this for 25 years, traveling around the world looking for spiders. He did really well to find this, and we were trying to get up there, and I couldn't even reach it. And you can see he's climbed up a tree. That's me standing there, and I'm 6'2", so I don't know, seven, seven, eight feet. But Guy went back, because this was not too far from our lodge. He hiked all the way back, however far it was, and, and found this lot ladder in one of the little outbuildings. And came back, and we got up there, and we saw this and coming out of the tree. And we were shocked because we thought Tapmikini Skigus was only found in French Guiana. At the time, like I said, I did not know how close the type locality was to the border. I did not know if it got across the river. I didn't know at all. We were very surprised to find this, and I, I don't. I think it was the most excited we were, except maybe when we found Blondie finally. That's another spoiler, I guess. So. 
So yeah, that was a that was a really good day. We were happy campers. Um, that's the first one. So finally, we began making trips down to Brownsburg Nature Park. Now, if I would have been in charge, we would have stayed down at the nature park. But we had a great resort down at Bobbin Hall. And we started making this drive. And the, like I said, down in that area by Broken Pond, though, they do a lot of mining. So the, the paved road is very good. So getting down to the entrance, or I should say the road that leads up to the entrance, was fairly easy. It only took us like 30 minutes. But then to travel this entrance road in our little you know, crossover utility vehicle uh, was near impossible. And this was at the end of the dry season. So I can imagine what it would be like during the wet season. And then once you actually got to where you'd go up in the nature park, it would climb from sea level to 1,700 feet in elevation as a single lane track, sheer drop off down the side, these huge ruts. I think I've gotten a slide coming up here. Yeah, and that's the way the road was. And we're in this little rental car. And at the same time we're trying to get up this road, they had these little, like, uh, I, don't, I don't even think they've sold them in the United States, but they're like little, uh, like a giant minivan. They're like a cross between a minivan and a bus. <laughs> And uh, the, they're the people that you hire if you're more sensible than us to get you up there. Because a lot of the people that stay up there, because the, the, the nature park itself is run down. The only people that are really staying there are true like backpackers. People that, that don't, that just want to sling a hammock underneath something goes and pulls a mosquito net over them. They don't need a hotel. So they don't even have a vehicle. So they're just basically getting bussed in from the airport or from the capital or wherever they were staying. And so as you're on this single track trying to climb up there, and it, you know we got all three guys get out and they're directing on each side, and I'm driving, and we're trying to rock the car when it gets in a big rut. You have these little buses trying to beat their horn and fly by. Yeah, but it was pretty treacherous. So I would have liked to have just stayed there, but we, over the course of like six, six days, made daily treks up this road, <laughs> and then finally saw the sign for the entrance. So as soon as we got up to the nature park, the first time. There were some Dutch tourists up there that had taken this bus that had got up there right before us, and then there was a bunch of commotion off to the side. We're like, what are they looking at? Well, this is what they were looking at. It was a spider monkey. So we rushed over there, you know, got our cameras out, take pictures of the spider monkey. Um, and at the same time, somebody yelled snake. And, you know, I got a good ear for the word snake. And uh, so you know, I left them with their monkeys. I'm like, what? And I, I go rushing over. And I look up under the roof of this one building, and I said, guy, go back to the car and get my snake hook. And up on top, and I don't know if this is going to play. I don't know. Did you have to link it, Martin? I don't know. I know it looked fine. I don't know if I had to link the video or if it's embedded here. Let's see if it works. I don't think we'll really have the audio, though. It's only a short little clip. And if it doesn't work, it's on my YouTube channel for anybody who wants to see it. Oh, let's try this. All right, let's not try this. Exotic Fauna YouTube channel, if you want to see the video, it's just a couple minutes long. But what was up there was this. It used to be in the genus Sustes, it's now Spilotes. And that snake is easily eight feet long. They're a very long, slender snake. It was up on the roof. I had a guy go get my snake hook, and I guided it off. And then a whole crowd came around. So I was like, this is the greatest place ever. And it was, it was just like a really exciting 30 seconds of chaos. And if you, if you watch the video, you'll hear Paul in the background. Uh, there's also a 16-minute video on us finding the Goliath tarantula there, so it's worth going to my YouTube channel to check it out. But uh, you hear Paul in the background saying, Mad Michael the Snake Wrangler, and all these people wanted to come over and take their picture with it, so we made quite a commotion when we arrived. But we weren't really looking for this, as fun as it was to find. We were looking for that. The reason we knew, we already knew they were there. You, know, you can do a Google search and find plenty of images of Blondie at Brownsburg. That's where we expected to find one. But we were very encouraged when, as soon as we started talking to the staff up there, she pulled out her cell phone, because like I said, it doesn't matter where you are in a third or fourth world country, nowadays everybody's got cell phones. And she pulled out this picture. And what's interesting to us now is because, like I said, the top, you know, where she is right now at the reception, where the actual nature park accommodations are, is at the top of the hill, and it's like 1,700 feet of elevation. That's a, an ultimate male that was wandering around there. So you assume that there must be females up there, but we did not find females that high up. We ended up finding them about halfway up the road. But we did find these breeding pools. This is a, a relative of the cane toad that was real pretty, and these, it, the rainy season had just started. This was like uh, right at the beginning of December now, I think. And uh, they had these pools. 
And of course, right as soon as we went into buildings, look at this, this is just the outhouse. I found this one on the wall. This one's up in the rafters of, a, of a, like a picnic pavilion type of thing. So we started finding a vicular area right away. This, this is a, I don't know if I have a picture, but this, this, this silk tube must have been three feet long. And more turnip tail geckos. Pretty typical vehicular area that we found at Brownsburg. And I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but there's also a video of this on my YouTube channel, but it's right there. There's another Labaria. That guy almost stepped on again. This is Guy and I went off on our own uh, to do a little herping because, like I said, uh, Andrew focuses only on tarantulas and he likes to try to get me to focus only on tarantulas, but if a frog or a snake goes by, I'm quickly forget about tarantulas. So Guy and I went off by ourselves and we were finding all kinds of cool stuff that you're about to see. And there's that Lavaria that he had passed by. And it was, it was a, like I said, a film clip. Adelopus, amazing frog that Martin mentioned. Different species than the one that he saw in French Guiana. Yeah, this is Hugmodi. Um, that sense, that huge reserve they have in the middle of Suriname, which I think is where you're trying to get when you couldn't get down that road or whatever, that huge reserve, they have the, the real purple and pink ones. These have recently, you know, I can't answer your question about the laws there, but I do know that they must allow some legal export because there have been some of these coming from Suriname into the pet trade recently. But supposedly they're all males and nobody could establish breeding programs because everything that's coming in is, is a male, so I don't know why. Also been, I've also heard that tadpoles of the Antilopus, they need current, like they need like little river or trees with currents, so that's why they're hard to breed in captivity as well. Oh, that's very interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah. And dark frogs. That was the common one at Brownsburg. Actually, we actually saw this species at, uh, at our resort too, at Bob and All. That is an unknown brown theraphosid. <laughs> there it is. Well, actually, that was a different spider, but I just wrote Neosenith Tarsus question mark. And Martin would know better than I would. I mean, this was the, the plain brown spider that we did not identify. I don't know what it is. And that, we believe, is your species Suriname, right? I, I said before the conference, I sent this photo to Martin and asked him what he thought about it. This was the only one we found of this. It's a tiny little bugger. And I don't know if it was Andrew or Guy, I'm not going to accuse anyone, but this was quickly lost, possibly trod upon. So, I mean, we had it in an insect, we posed it, I took this quick snapshot, and then we never saw this spider again. And it was the only one we saw where we were. Well, we saw lots of those. So finding the lie. Um, what we started doing uh, in 2006 in Costa Rica, Paul, one of his jobs is he works with the council in the UK, he does some type of pest control or something, and he had kind of a, uh, a uh, endoscope. But we found these, these rigid sea snakes, uh, since then, are really excellent because they got a really nice bigger screen on it and you can zoom and and uh, they're, they're made for plumbers to look down your pipes. And these are essential. And the point I'm, gonna, I'm making here is that uh, if you're gonna be going out and looking down these holes, these are really helpful to see if something's in there before you take spend a bunch of time digging, if you don't have any signs. Because we did not, I was actually, another thing that I was kinda uh, surprised when I saw Martin's pictures is how much silk around those Theraposa, how much silk you saw around the openings, because we didn't see that much. We, I mean, you, most of the holes we would look down would have these big, uh, I forgot what species, uh, a frog it was, these reddish frogs, and, uh, and some of them would, you know, have all kinds of mammals, whatever. They, they just looked like they could be anything holes, and that's what, where we found their aposa. But you would never have been able to find them if you couldn't look down first. And uh, the, 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 it was a lot of fun the first time we used it in Costa Rica when we, when we found Megaphobema mesomalis. Um, my old friend Bill Cornick, who's bred a lot of those, uh, those type of tarantulas, those big, itchy, pretty things that I will never eat. Um, he, he claims that part of the success was feeding them earthworms. And a lot of these tarantulas do eat earthworms. I mean, if, you, if you're keeping Zanethus, Pamphibedius, any of those big South Americans, feed them night crawlers. Uh, and that is what they eat. When I saw, when I looked with my scope in the Sferbothria Hoffmanni, they were eating worms. When I looked at Mesomalus, they were eating worms. Almost everything was feeding on worms. And, and Bill used to use night crawlers. And he used to, before he dropped out of the hobby into, into the vapor, he used to, breed a lot of those type of spiders. So it's just an idea. 
Um, but it was, that's another thing that's interesting. So now, so before you've disturbed them, you can see their habitat. You can see what's in there with them. And so that, that was an essential tool that I'll credit for a lot of our success with, with Blondie, because it's hard work. But this was really what got us to a location, to an elevation, trying to figure out between sea level, 1,700 feet, where we were going to find them. We're in a huge nature park. Where's the best place to look? And this was towards the end of our trip. And this was what really keyed us on to, into the location. It's just in a little scrape. Now, this isn't a typical embankment burrow. This is just kind of like a, could just be from erosion. This is kind of like a divot in the bank. Andrew looks over, and he found that. And we knew that it was Blondie spiraling, and we knew that this, you know, mother must be around. Let's search this area. And this is the about 700 to 800 feet of elevation. That's where we actually found uh, Blondie. But like I said, they must be up higher if that male was all the way up there. You can see it does not have any pink feet like Sturmia or Apophysis. Everybody knows what that is. So here's the burrow. And I think in this next slide you can see it. I mean, that's two feet down there. <laughs> Seeing her coming up or coming up or two. And underneath, right next to it, underneath one of these holes, another labaria, ever present. That's an opening. See, like I said, you don't see that silk that yeah, Martin showed. Just a, just a hole that you would not know what was in it if you didn't have an endoscope to look down. And this is extracted one from that burrow. Happy campers, big hairy, itchy spider. Mm -hmm. Size reference with the flashlight. All four of us all happy and tired and sweaty and thinking about beer. Grand mm -hmm. Tangi is their local language for thank you. So, that, I mean, that place was just an amazing place to stay. And it, it, this guy was so helpful to us. I don't know how many frogs he had brought me out and, and just, you know, he's always trying to catch stuff. I was, oh, there's a spider over here. There's what you I mean, he just put a lot of effort into taking care of us. And actually what I did is, he, you'll see one of the raffle prizes tonight is, uh, one, is my photography. It's like a, one of those books you can make your photography. After I got back, I got all these pictures from our trip, pictures of him, these pictures, you know, all these pictures. I made this really fancy photography book, and I sent it to him. And he actually called me on the phone like two months later and thanked me. And that made, it was so worthwhile. He was great. I almost wanted to pay for a dentist. And the real reason that he was so great is right before we leave, I mean, we're done. And we had plans to go back up to Pari Maribo, and to be honest with you, for the last three days, we sat around a pool and were tourists, and just relaxed and had a, and enjoyed each other's company before we went back to, uh, well, for me, the United States, for them, England. This was on my bucket list. Of, I got a list of uh, my, my reptile find bucket lists, one of which was the tiger, last, tiger rattlesnake last night was on that list. Um, so that was great. But this was on the top of my list for certain. I don't know if you don't know what a polychris is, it's one of the coolest lizards there is. It's a we call bush anoles or monkey lizards. Uh, and he had taken me down the trail right before. I mean, we were loading up the car, and he's like, "Mr. Michael, you know, blah blah blah, go down the trail." Look at the tails on those things. I mean, they're just amazing lizards. It's like right at the end. I mean, literally in the last ten minutes, one of the one of my favorite finds on the entire trip. That, that's the same lizard. Just once we started bothering it, it quickly lost its green. And you can see, it's not happy right now, but it kind of illustrates its tail and its size. And how much thinner I am before I go on these trips. I train for these trips. <laughs> right now, I didn't train for this one. <laughs> so we went back to this apartment, and we hung around this pool. And that's what we did for our last three days, which is which is really nice after living the way we were, and we were so successful. I mean, it was everything we had hoped for, even though we just covered such a small amount of the country. And I enjoyed it a lot. I, I really love the country. I would definitely go back there. It's hard to go to a place more than once. Martin and I were talking about this. He's been to French Guiana three times. But for me, you know, there's so many places I want to see. Why, you know, I don't want to repeat myself on the one hand, but in a lot of... Uh, on the other hand, I would love to go back there. I would love to use a float plane to get out to the central reserve where we didn't, could never get by because I would be willing to travel that way. It's just not the way our team operates. 
So we just enjoy each other's company and hanging around there. So like I said, these, these guys are great, and it's a privilege to travel with them. We, The three of us here will be spending a month in November together, and I can't wait. I can't tell you where. And that's at our camp. So getting back to this spider, this is our hobby spider, the only uh, the only one in here that is, uh, is not in nature. And those are the species from the Guianas. Um, you can see the ones from Suriname. Now, I would, we can disregard that one. Who knows what that is? Obviously, that we expect that to be a synonym. We expect that to be a synonym. So you'd be left with just a vicularia metallica, which I've already explained that this species based on Fukushima would be synonymous with a vicularia. We'll see. Um, and then these are a couple other species uh, from the Guianas, which I would assume would also just fall into a vicularia. So I think, you know, she would argue that that's all one species, and I am very inclined to believe. Those are just the four from Suriname. So, I might have spent a lot of time on this. Um, these were the original descriptions of, of the differences between them that I intended to go over, but I don't want to get too into the, the technical part of it. But here we get to a, a Metallica. And what they describe, if, if, you, if you read German or you get, accept my translation of my uh, high school German, Gorgeous, lustrous, metallic coloration, very long hair on the legs, which is something that we would say about our hobby one. Cephalothorax, their old term, obviously. It's covered with brilliant, glossy, greenish hairs, woolly, dense, and short. All legs have very long and prominent, thicker seedy, on a brownish color with lighter tips. Now it mentions brownish, so could that be reddish brown? You know, we would say that you can't have reddish brown or it wouldn't be metallica. And then the abdomen, jet or velvet black, otherwise same coloration as legs, not red in, that, in other words. So this leads you to believe that it was a different spider, but we all have to wait and see somebody who does something else. That's from the original Linnaeus description, which you know, 1758, after after her book was published, you know, it's like 40 years after her her uh, Insects of Suriname was published, and that's what he used to describe this bird-eating, bird-eating spider. It's from his original publication of the of the. Um, so getting back to this, this are pictures that I found online, so I guess these would also not be in nature. I just swiped these from Google. Um, these are different what hobbyists are calling Metallica. So these are what hobbyists are calling Metallica, which is what I would call Metallica, but as I mentioned at the beginning, if we're going to, if you've got these and you, you, if somebody sells it to you, you'll only buy it if it looks like that and you start breeding together just like you do with reptiles. Eventually you're selectively breeding uh, for a certain type and we'll have a species that we can call Metallica or, or pet trade Metallica, even if it is just a vicularia vicularia. So the spiders that we found in this area to show the variation again are these, out where the farthest northwest we went, were these spiders. And then going to the next, around the city, they all basically look like that. Out of the plantation, we have these guys. So a lot of variation, you could argue. I mean, if I just showed you those without any context by themselves and asked a bunch of people what do you think this species is, I think I'd get a bunch of different answers. And around Bobbin Hall, if you ever seen that, this picture has been everywhere. It's in the raffle tonight. Um, you can see that we photoshopped out that little swimming line in the, in the picture that you see everywhere. And these are the ones at Brownsburg. So just showing you the variation of avicularia, avicularia in, the, in, the, in the country. And then down at Don Tabai, this one looks the most like our pet trade you tell. And this is Martin's picture of that one that's, that, that they found. In, uh, is this about where you were? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's the picture he sent me of it. This was uh, raised in captivity. Oh, that shows you what the avicular area from here are. And that this this one's on a website that really is it's supposedly from the Cipollini district. Now that's the grassland area way down south. And this is the one that I could find online that was taken in the wild that was most like the ones more like what you showed what our hobby is. 
But it's kind of interesting that this location that, that he uh, that is way down there, almost in Brazil. So, like I said, I'm not answering. I'm just I'm asking questions more than providing answers. I think, but just showing you the, the variation and how confusing some of this stuff is to work out. The reason I put this up there is if you're interested in this kind of stuff, there's an article on this trip of mine. I've kind of done some stuff with Herb Nation lately, and one of the future upcoming issues, there will be an article on my, on my trip that I wrote for them that I think you might enjoy. And, uh, and my friend Nick Mutton does a podcast, the Nick Mutton Show, on their, on their radio thing. You can, get, you can subscribe to their podcast on iTunes, and uh, I recently uh, taped an episode of that that should be coming out any day now. I was hoping it was before this on the Nick Mutton Show. Questions? Emily. Can you go to one slide without raining on spiders? How about later? I think it's like, this is 278 slides. I think it's like 100 slides earlier. Sir? Yeah, how much do those endoscopes cost? Uh, a couple hundred bucks. And did you know, did you talk about the, the uh, ants with, in the, near the spiders? Are the ants pretty common in all the... the no, no, no. It's not, it's, like just, a, it's not like it's a commensal relationship. No, it's just, it just was interesting how often they would be around those things and how they had to live being constantly irritated by these ants. I, it's just, it was just a, it's just a passing comment, I guess. They, they, weren't, they weren't that common with it, but they were definitely at the zoo. Most of them were like covered in those ants. Anybody else? Perfect. Chris. People, try, you've seen it probably, the reason you're asking, you've probably seen it translated a couple times. But uh, the original genus, see the thing is kind of, Jason and I were just talking about this, the thing that's confusing with a lot of these Avicularia species, he's like, wasn't there an Avicularia in California? And that's because Avicularia is one of the oldest genera. Yeah, it's, it's so old that a lot of, it just was any Theraphosid spider was blumped into it. So there were a lot of terrestrial, Theraphosid species that were in the genus. Um, Lamarck is the, in 1818 is the guy who made it. So when Linnaeus did it, it wasn't Avicularia Avicularia. It was what? Scotra Avicularia, I think? And then in 1818, Lamarck is the one who erected the genus Avicularia. Now you'll see it translated in two different ways. To me, it means bird eater. But you'll see it, you know, cool, like culinary, Galeria. And AV, like avis, you know, birds. Um, I probably just butchered a French word, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So that, to me, it means bird eating, and hence why they're called Vogelspinnen, you know, bird spiders, and you know where that term originally came from. I would credit all the way back to Madame Marion in you know 1714 or whatever when she published Insects of Cerno. I think that comes from the culture, actually. In South America, they refer to them as bird eating spiders, Asia or earth tigers. Well, that that's yeah. that's um, come on. Many many years later, all these yeah. different general terms, but but I mean, they, they seem to be country specific and it can be translated. Who knows where it came from? But, you know, it, you got the local take of what these monsters were. Any other questions before Fred? Thanks. <laughs>